make you, me feel better, man. Control Alt Delete. Up down up down left right left right A B B A B isn't that what it was? The O P D. I hate that we all remember that. I wonder how many how many people nowadays don't have any idea what that that's a reference to. Ready? All right. All right. Cool. So, color is what it is. Um, I can, I'll pass out the slides. If anybody's interested, I'll um, I'll either put them on SlideShare or something. This is a recurring talk, so you'll see video of it elsewhere. Um, all right. Cool. So my name is Raf. Um, I work for Optiv. Um, this talk is called Losing Battles, Winning Wars. It's a reboot on active defense. Uh, what's going to happen is you're going to realize that the first chunk of this is actually, uh, well, much more basic than that, but there's a good buildup coming here, so bear with me. Um, a little bit about me and a little bit about my team. Um, our group is chartered with creating program strategies, so we're solutions R&D. We have an applied R&D organization as well, which is all technical folks. Um, we're sort of a cross between what Gartner and Forrester do combined with like a big four analyst firm, we create um, knowledge uh, frameworks for organizations. So uh, all the things that you have in your enterprise security programs, uh, we help try to organizations figure out if they're asking the right questions to get answers that are even remotely accurate. So a little bit of background on what, what this is from understanding winning, losing, and playing the defensive long game. Um, a little bit of humor along the way. If you haven't had your Red Bull, but I. Uh, or whatever energy drink they have here, I encourage you to do so. All right, so this is uh, knowledge based on research. Uh, do a lot of um, talking to uh, leading world-class organizations uh, on the topic of threat intelligence. I think threat intelligence is one of those things that everybody wants to do. Uh, my old bosses describe it like sex in high school. Everybody's an expert, but knows, nobody's really done it. Um, it's okay to laugh at that. We're all out of high school, right? So <clears throat> we drop some data from industry experts, um, some of the leading minds, experts, not experts. You all know the difference. Uh, your mileage may vary. So this comes out of essentially studying somewhere around 65 organizations. Um, talk, we, we had conversations some a little bit over 30 of the more well-known industry experts on the topic of intelligence. Um, and then obviously solutions providers. So I want to start with a basis for understanding uh, what we talk about winning and losing in security from a conference that's heavily, conference scene that's very heavily uh, offensive focused. Uh, it's really interesting to try to think about what does that mean from a security perspective. And I'll start with this that security is really hard. Uh, anybody that's done defense uh, understands security is hard. Every, anybody that's done offense understands why the people that do defense say security is hard. Uh, and widgets really don't help solve the problem. Um, I, we, I've met way too many security organizations that have more tools than they have people. Uh, and whether that's a good idea or not, I'll let you decide on your own. But if your ratio of dashboards to humans is anything over, uh, you know, like one to two, you're, you're doing it wrong. Um, it, but it's not the tools that themselves that are the problem. I think a, a big chunk of the issue is the fact that how they're implemented and how they're used. Anytime, I, I've spent a lot of time studying how security leadership functions how people build programs and how people structure their approach to any given thing. Uh, and one of the things that is consistently visible is that when we are driven, we're sort of the moth to the flame driven, right? Um, somebody says new shiny object, we all gravitate towards it. If you, who's been to RSA this year? What was the big topic this year? Anybody know? Ah, you guys don't go to RSA. Cool. Uh, <laughs> Nobody knows. Excellent. Well, same thing. Black Cat was the same thing. But it's realistically, you know, it used to be cloud security. Then we went to threat intelligence was the big word. Then we're like next gen endpoint. And now then it'll be analytics and it'll be something else. But inevitably, it's something new to solve some problem that we're not really sure we have. Uh, and so we're generally really bad at security. Uh, and you can notice that everywhere, right? Um, security companies get popped. Uh, even those that are spying on people and are uber hackers uh, get popped in really, really nasty ways. So it turns out security people are also bad at security. There's a shocker. Um, I think we over-focus on things that are super advanced and we have a tendency to forget all the things that make, uh, this is one of those great times where I, if I remember this quote correctly, I never can, 
But uh, many Python fans in the house, all right? Building a castle, sank into the swamp, build another one, burn down, sank into the swamp. We just keep building castles on sand. It, it's not working, it's not going to work, but it's, it's Einstein's definition of madness. Um, and I think we fail absolutely miserably at doing security fundamentals and basics. And this is where it, it, it really kind of pains me to say, all right, if we want to talk about active defense, what active defense means, we'll define that in a minute. We need to start asking, with, start with the question of how's your visibility? I need, I need, if you're on the defensive side, it's really interesting to think about visibility of what, you, what you're able to see on your network, on your applications, in your systems. And you can't stop what you can't see. Ask a deer at 2 a.m. with your headlights off, right? No? Nobody? Okay, fine. We're in the South. We can make jokes like that. Uh, it's really hard to stop what you can't see because you don't know what it is, right? And it's even worse to stop things you can't, it's even more difficult to stop things that you can't understand. And there's lots of examples of this, but we've all seen this picture uh, where somebody creates a really cool idea. Uh, is that even visible on that screen? All right, sorry. So we, we create these grandiose, extremely complex, and by the way, when security gets complex, that gets even more complicated and worse. So create these ideas of what we want, um, what we think we need to solve, then we create even more complex tools and processes to solve them. Forget the processes, get more tools, that's gonna solve the problem, and then gets more complicated. So by the time we're done, we've got, essentially, if you've ever been in a wiring closet, uh, a server room after like seven different people have owned and operated that, that wiring closet, and somebody says, we have a cable that's out, right? There's 300 places where cables are plugged in, and you generally have to sort of Follow, follow, follow through. That's what security is turned into. Uh, and that's why pen tests can be done uh, by just about anybody and, and get something interesting, right? Finding a hole in an organization is not hard. I don't know if, if I ask this question, I, I, you know, if anybody's tried a pen test and found nothing, raise your hand. Right. You always find something. So from an enterprise defense perspective, let me ask, what does it, meant to fa what does it mean to fail? At security, right? On the, on, if you're on the defensive, what does it actually mean to fail? Answer. Not fixing stuff you found five times in a row. That's actually a really good, that, that's a good way to think about it. Depends on, I like that. See, now we're going back to goals. All right, so let me, let me ask you from a different perspective, and this may be a little bit better. Organizations talk about, and, and if you've ever had to deal with a board of directors or a higher level management, they say things like, we can't possibly be hacked. We can't be the next story, right? We can't ever, I don't ever have to, I don't ever want to write a press release that's, and sign it that says, you know, dear customer, we've lost your data, sorry, okay? If you've been hacked, is that considered a failure? Maybe, maybe not. So here, here's, here's the deal. I think we've set, are the bar for, secu for security uh, and goals unrealistically high. Uh, and I'll explain that in, in, in very, three very succinct points here. I think as defenders, there's, very, there's three things that you really have to start thinking about. And again, we went through and talked to a bunch of these security organizations that are various stages of operational maturity, but I think there's only three key questions that actually matter, all right? Anybody have a military background here? All right, you guys will probably get this faster than anybody else. So there's only three things that matter. The first one is, do you control the situation? By the way, these are cumulative. So do you control the situation? It's an interesting question because in, in a lot of cases, um, even if we're not hacked, we don't control the situation. If you've ever found out, if you've ever performed an incident response that's lasted 36 hours only to realize that the network that you're, uh, the big thing that you're seeing is completely legit, just nobody told you they cross-connected a new network to, to the uh, organization. Of, it, that happens all the time. I've been a part of it several times. So do you control the situation? It's an interesting question. So if not, then I would say you are failing with an ING at the end of it. Right? Not failed yet, but you're getting there. All right. The next question is, have critical assets been exfiltrated? Now, that's an interesting question. How many of you guys, if you, who here works on the enterprise side? How many of you guys, keep raising your hands. If, keep your hands up if you know if you can identify your corporate critical assets. Lots of hands went down. That's scary. So it's re remember that thing I said about really hard to defend what you don't understand, right? 
you work, for, you go get hired at a, at a company. They say, hey, do all the security things. Make sure nothing, nothing bad happens. That's fantastic. That's like sending a, a five-year-old out in the playground and saying, make sure nothing bad happens to them. I have a two-year-old. I know how, I have two of them. I know how this works. You lose. Um, they'll find ways to hurt themselves. Um, so if critical assets have been exfiltrated, but you first had to identify them, then I would say you are failing. So this is two out of three. We're still on the ING space. Um, we haven't failed yet. So what's un another thing that's kind of interesting is uh, data governance projects. If you've ever been a part of one, um, I, I salute you uh, because you're still here and you haven't quit. Uh, but data governance projects tend to run like decades. You know, we have a three-month project and identify all the critical data in the organization two years later. How's that project going? We're about 30%. Right, three CISOs later, we're about 10%. Like, wait a second, how'd that happen? Well, it turns out the other two are wrong. We've got new data now. Uh, but it, these are very fundamental questions. How can you tell if bad things are happening if you can't define bad? All right, so another one here. Last and final one. Is the situation recoverable? That's an interesting question. When does this apply? Crickets. Ah, there we go. If you've been breached but not exfiltrated. Somebody had to say that. Cool. So one of the interesting things I keep hearing is, and if you've paid attention to all these ridiculous, ridiculous hackback discussions all over the place, one of the quotes you've probably seen repeated over and over on Twitter, because we all paste it to each other, is the quote by uh, somebody, some general somewhere, that thought it would be a really good idea to say things like, well, we might have to go back and get our data off that server. It's like, I don't think you know how the internet works, right? Somebody stole stuff. That means they made a copy. Now they have a copy, probably a billion copies someplace. You going, taking it back isn't going to accomplish the thing you think it's going to accomplish. So situation is irrecoverable. Can you get back to the state that you were at before this bad thing happened? If the answer is no, then you've actually, if you've all three of those, if you're failing, failing, now you, you can't recover, then you failed. But there's a lot of things that have to fall in place in order to do that. L let me give you some thoughts for perspective. So website defacements happen all the time. Uh, a lot, right? Uh, that is uh, that is one way of looking at it. Malware on your systems. Who here does not have a piece of malware anywhere in their network? Liars. Um, distributed denial of service attacks, right? It used to be that these things were very, it started out childish pranks. If anybody was on IRC a long time ago and understands bots and network, network splits and stuff like that, that was a long time ago in a kingdom far away, but it was fun. Uh, and then DDoS became one way to knock your competitors offline. Now it's countries lobbying big globs of data against each other, and you can watch the North Map go pew, 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 and it's fun. Uh, but these are inconveniences in a lot of cases. Versus what we think about is stolen trade secrets. And a stolen trade secret can be things like if, you, if you've uh, either worked in or work around the pharmaceutical industry, patents last about 25 years. Right, once you've patented. But before you can get a drug to market and make your billions, you spend the billions to R&D it. There's a lot of time and effort that goes into it. Right, So the big thing happening overseas uh, in the Asian market, um, they say it's thanks to McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and, and, and all those fun fast food places, is their population is um, expanding at the waist, let's, let's just say. Right? They're getting less healthy. The, the rate of diabetes is shooting up. So they can either start from scratch, where we were about 25 years ago, or they can find all the pharmaceutical research companies that are here in the U.S. that have really crappy security and borrow theirs. Anybody want to guess which one's happening? Right, they're not going to go. They're not going to wait 25 years to save lives. So if you're in that industry, stolen trade secrets means that that drug that you spent $10 billion investing in, it's, you think is going to make you a return of $200 billion over 25 years, that just evaporated. That's, that's potentially not even career ending, it's business ending. It's, that's real impact, right? So look at this from the, def from the um, defender's perspective. Def we have to understand these things because we have to understand what's actually important to us and why it's important to us. If you're, if you're on the attack side, uh, which I think many of you are, if you're on the attack side, there's only one thing that actually matters. What is that one thing? Close. Right. Achievement on objective. Right? 
if somebody says go own that network, generally they won't tell you that if it's a, if it's an actual thing or something going on because there's no purpose behind it. But people that are financially incented either through organized crime, through nation states, they don't just get told, hey, go deface this website. They get told, here's a specific thing I need you to get. See, that specific thing is the objective. Whatever actions they perform, they need to get it out of there. So whether it's, uh, the, the, the classic example is, you know, your quarterly earnings as a public company get announced Monday at, 7, at uh, 8 a.m. on CNBC. Your CEO is going to go on uh, and be interviewed. He'll talk about it. He'll publish the report. But until then, because that report's done about two weeks before, until then, anybody that sees that, besides a few people inside the company, can do things like trade against you or against your stock, right, if they know how your company did. So there are people absolutely banging at your, at your door and your windows and everywhere else trying to get at that report, trying to get at that data. But that data is only valid until your CEO starts to speak and says, yes, we had a great quarter, or now we had a kind of a crappy quarter. Because at that point, it's worth it, it's public data. So if you don't, if you understand what's important and understand what's, why somebody would want that, you can then start building defenses that actively defend. See, active defense. I told you it makes sense eventually. So if, if your adversary hasn't actually managed to achieve the action against that objective, guess what? They haven't won. So this is one of those like, hey, if you haven't won, that means I have, I have to have won. All right? So if they haven't won, then that means they failed. And so it turns out that we don't actually suck at security. We just don't understand what we're doing and why. Right? And this is slightly unfortunate because I think we're doing actually a much better job than most of us give ourselves credit for on a defensive side. Because we're all sick of hearing how every, everything is easy to break, every app is vulnerable, nobody patches, blah, blah, blah. But there's plenty of networks that I can point to that have that are riddled with holes, but only in places that don't matter for anything. So sure, if you're going to go break into them, you got a whole host of servers to go poke at. But the best you're going to do is hit something public, and maybe use them against somebody else or annoy your, them or whatever. You're not getting anything critical because they understand what their critical stuff is. So I think with if we look at this as a as a focus, it's possible to sort of start shifting the way that security works and uh, and the way we think. And, and we go from uh, what we call a short game, which is discrete, discrete incidents. Uh, and unfortunately, entirely too many uh, security operations organizations and incident responders think short game and discrete even incidents. In fact, some of the best run IR teams are, that are uncoordinated at the high level end up working the same incident from different angles, unfortunately. Um, and, and this is just a fact. So we're going from this idea of a short game to a long game to start thinking about campaigns and objectives. Because for various reasons, I'll explain in a little bit, um, we have tools and we have the ability to automate. We've had that for years. There is absolutely no reason we should be getting popped by things that are the equivalent of coded. I, I would say by a 10-year-old, but we have some really smart 10-year-olds, so that doesn't work anymore, um, you know, that, that aren't, aren't really meant to be malicious. So let's talk about the defensive long game, because I think there's a little bit to be talked about here. Um, so first off, uh, fundamentals. I, I keep saying this over and over, um, and maybe one day, sometime before I retire, this will actually stick, but fundamentals are extremely important. Nobody does them right. Why? Because it's freaking hard. Who's got a solid change management process here? All right? How many of you guys can identify every asset on your network? The person raising their hand probably works for a government entity. <laughs> Right. Um, so uh, here's the other thing that I really, really don't understand is there's been several blog posts lately about a, just absolute hate for ITIL. I get it. ITIL is not pretty and it's not sexy and it won't get you on CNN. But if you can't do fundamentals that way, right, like you can't identify your assets, you know, like this, you've got an asset. What's the classification of that asset? Is it important to the company? Is it not? What's the configuration that's on it? Little news flash, uh, and maybe it's, let me actually do this by a show of hands real quick. So, you guys remember uh, Heartbleed? wasn't that long ago, right? When you guys, when you heard of, on the defensive side, when you heard of Heartbleed, how many of you guys first thing you did was go find a scanner and scan your network for Heartbleed? Dear God, why? The answer is simple because you have zero configuration management, and that's a problem because you've just wasted. Hours and hours of time. Put your hand down. 
You, I know what you're saying. Stop this. Um, uh, well, okay, that's a different problem, though. But it but stems from the same exact issue, right? Management says, go scan for it. Primarily because they have zero faith in, your abil in, in the organization's ability to produce an accurate report on what we have vulnerable. Now, there's a couple of really, really well-oiled organizations that run really, really well and lean. And the first thing they did was what they did was go into their asset management tool, look up anything that had that was running an SSL uh, uh, library in it, open SSL library, went and looked at those. Now, did that cover 100%? Not even close. But the known knowns were now able to be addressed. Now you can go look for the unknowns. Right, not spending it. So we've got there's a there's an order of operations here that we're just not very good at. Um, configuration management, change management, classifications. You know, this all speaks to things like threat modeling. Who does threat, active threat modeling here? All right, not enough hands. As defenders, it, threat modeling revolves goes right back to that basic point. Do you know what your you know where your weaknesses? How do you find our weaknesses? We'll know what the weaknesses are by figuring out what's attackable and what's high value. Unfortunately, most of us don't know what's high value, so that that, that endeavor becomes really boring because everything's important. Um, I think it's like the Lego song where everything is awesome. Um, so look, I, I say one of the one of the most most sad things is that we don't know our own battlefields. Um, and I, I uh, friend of mine, Dmitry Alperovich from uh, CrowdStrike, I'll just give him a tip of the hat because he keeps saying this over and over, and it's just it's just something worth repeating that he's worked too many IR cases where if they want to get an accurate map of the network, they look through the, the dump that the bad guys made. This does not bode well for defenders. Just ask yourself mentally how old the network map is in your, in your, of your organization. If the, if the word years is creeping into your mind, this is not good, right? So I think we've got some home ice advantage here. I'm a Blackhawks fan, deal with it. Um, if, if anybody's a hockey fan here, you'll understand what home ice advantage generally means, right? Boards behave differently when you slam a puck against them in different cities. In some cities, you, if you hit the puck against the boards, it springs back. Some of them, it just hits and flops and dies there. So you got to know, as the person chasing that puck, how it's going to behave. you got to know that it's your network. You need to know why there are packets that, of this particular type going from here to here, that those should be there or should not be there. Because, quite frankly, defending the unknown is impossible. Again, you can't defend, you can't protect what you don't understand. You can't defend what you don't see, don't know. So step one, unfortunately, of any good active defense strategy is mapping your own damn space. Right? Now, this is, uh, I, I will simply caution you by saying I tried this once. Um, and and, and uh, I'll spare you the details, but I... Uh, um, it was a long time ago, and there was a VMX va VMS VAX machine that doesn't like to be touched by Nmap. We'll just leave it at that. Um, so you can really crater some big things that that make this bah, bah, bah sound when you when you crater them. But uh, actively mapping your space is really really important. So collecting data and building baselines. Anybody here actually build some baselines of their network? Okay, that's one hand. All right. So this means that if somebody's already on your box scanning the other machines in your network, you'll never know because you don't know if that's normal or not, except for gut feeling, which is great, except for that uh, that would be okay if you had the equivalent of like a 128K network uh, line in your, in your network, but we're all talking about multiple gigabits at a time here. So if you can read packet streams that fast, I'd really like to talk to you. Um, but we need to collect data and build some baselines, primarily because we want threat intelligence, right? This is generally where I think uh, most people want to apply it. They've actually failed at the other things. They don't know what their network looks like. They don't know what their, who their users are. They don't know where their critical assets are. They have absolutely no, no idea how change control works. So now the answer clearly is go get some of that good threat intelligence stuff, right? I've done this once or twice. It doesn't work well in the meeting, but it's like yeah, I, I think we need I think we need some of that. I'm like, yeah, you keep using that word. Mm. Do not think it means what you think it means. Uh, people interchange threat intelligence with threat data. Right? Intelligence is what refined data. 
So we have data, knowledge, intelligence, wisdom. They're like, yeah, just give me like a humongous IP a feed of bad IP addresses. That's threat intelligence. That'll that'll save me. Possibly, if you could have a slightest chance of anything doing with that. So intelligently incorporating externalities is really important. I think it is. But it's the whole intelligently incorporating stuff, right? So more data is not necessarily good. Anybody had the the uh, the, uh, the wonderful job of watching a sim here? Anybody responsible for the health and safety of a sim? Great. So you you know that they're kind of picky. Um, they tend to love humongous amounts of data generally, um, or not. So more data is not necessarily good. So. Think about it this way. So if, if somebody hands you 10,000 bad IP addresses, as in most of the OSINT or some of the commercial data feeds, I, I, in fact, if I were to give you 10,000 10, bad IP addresses right now, if I were to feed that to you on a regular basis, question number one is, where are you going to put that? If your answer is the SIM, you've said the wrong answer, generally speaking. Right? Here's why. The question, it's not even like where you're putting it, although one is indicative of the other, but what are you going to do with it? See, the whole point of intel threat intelligence is to feed an active defense cycle, which means actually doing something about the things that are being thrown at you. The ability to duck, right, more effectively. Um, and if you don't know where to put the data, then you've got a much harder question on your hands. And this is where, unfortunately, a lot of the time, your tools become an adversary and... Um, I said this comment earlier, you know, if, if you, your da the ratio of dashboards to people is anywhere near one to one or higher, turn some of your stuff off. Or just put it in autopilot mode and focus on one or two of them. It's a challenge that a lot of us face because over the years we walk into an organization where they've bought stuff, bought stuff, bought stuff, bought stuff, and somebody's got to maintain it. And there's seven dashboards yelling at you about this, you know, seven super critical things happening right now. Which one do you go figure out what to do with? The answer is not all seven. You don't clone yourself yet. So security tools tend to become our adversaries um, for, for reasons that uh, I think you guys get, but workloads as well. Right? IR people burn out like crazy when we just make them work 100 hours a week. I don't know why. So let me ask a, a more interesting question. Um, so those of you that, that do sim work, how many alerts did you receive a day? 100? A thousand? Ten? Order of magnitude question. Three. I like three. I can deal with three. Now, of course, if you're getting that few, there's two possible reasons for this. One, you don't see anything. Or two, you're really, really good at security. Or maybe you've figured out network segmentation finally. Um, but how many alerts do we receive per day? And there's this cycle where you... It comes in, you do some triage work on it, and you make a decision. Right? Ultimately, somebody's got to make a decision. That's the role of the event analyst in this life cycle. So in an eight-hour shift, those of you that know this answer, I've told you before, don't raise your hands, but in an eight-hour shift, how many events can an analyst process on average? You want to get, venture a guess? Five? Okay, anybody else? Good answer. Anybody else? Okay, so in, in, in an average eight-hour shift, the number is somewhere between 24 to 32, which means 15 to 20 minutes on average. For an event to pop up, you go do some anal basic analysis on it. 20 minutes may seem like a ton of time until you realize it takes about that, time, about that much time to log into most of these systems you're going to need to go investigate. So there's an alert that says, hey, you're being SQL injected, right? You're stealing, somebody's stealing lots of data from you. Okay, let's go and check out that system, check out the source, check out the destination, see whether it's important or not, right? It takes you about 15, 20 minutes. Now, 32 is not a lot. Considering that some of these dashboards produce upwards of 10,000 alerts a day, right? So not only do you drown in incidents, but if I'm a bad guy, if I'm pen testing somebody, all I'm going to do is like light them up, do random things, anything I can think of, and then the signal gets completely lost in the noise. This happens every day, right? And the answer to that is obviously tune your sim, because that's not as easy as it sounds. 
Anybody try that? Right, you can probably knock it down in order of magnitude, but until you really understand what's critical and what's not, where your important segments are, where they're not, then th that exercise is completely foolish. So it is one of those times where I'll tell you you got to slow down and go faster, and it's true. Um, stopping and focusing is super critical, right? Figuring out what threats are relevant. See, this, this, this is a recurring theme here. What's important? What threats are important is predicated on what's actually important in your organization. Because threats against non-relevant things aren't really threats. They're annoyances. See, there's this, um, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna write a blog post on this eventually because I just need to get it out there, but there's this tendency to use, uh, to create formulas in security to, under, to help people quantify things like risk. And one of the, my least favorite is this notion of impact times probability, right? And we know the law of small numbers. I was recently explained this by somebody who told me I was doing it wrong and I agreed. So it turns out that if you have something with a humongous impact with a really small probability, the answer to that, is, if you multiply them like most of us would, is wrong. Because to use an unfortunate situation, the events of 9-11, really, really small probability. The impact, not so much. So in that case, the risk technically would have been really, really low. I would beg to differ, right? So we can't, we've, we fall down to that. So figuring out what threats are relevant, it, it, things like impact, things like volume, things like value, uh, those are important. And I think we, one of the things that we continue to struggle with is everybody's system is owned by malware. It's, it's, just, it's time to just fess up. If you've got a network that you, where you claim you've got no malware on your systems, you're not looking hard enough, or you're not looking at all. And sometimes there's an adversary in there somewhere. So we did a little bit of digging, uh, and it turns out that there's technically three types of different threats. Um, I think there's actually two, but the third one's a transitional state. right? So I'll give these to you, and we can have a little bit of a discussion. You guys are welcome to chime in here. So there's three different types of threats. They're, they're basically differentiated, <coughs> excuse me, they're basically differentiated by the type of targeting and the type of persistence. So they are generic, targeted, and persistent, appropriately named. Generic threats are crypto locker, right, Zeus bot. These things that have infected millions of people, they're not targeted at you. There's generally nobody specifically piloting them to do anything specific. It's just threats. They're annoyances. Now, there's no targeting. There's no intent of persistence, which means that these are the equivalent of viruses, which is interesting because we have this stuff called antivirus, which I was told in the early 2000s would have solved this problem by now. So then the logical next question is, well, then why the hell are IR teams spending upwards of 80% of their time on this? That's a little bit of a tough question to ask. The next state, next type of threat is targeted. Targeted means somebody's taken something generic, made a small tweak, repurposed it, re repackaged it, and pushed it over to you. Now, I say you, I mean like you generically. So they're targeting pharmaceuticals. They're targeting, you know, banking. They're targeting something, not you specifically, right? So when you get down to this, it's, yes, there's a bit of targeting, but there's no thoughts on persistent. This is the proverbial smashing grab. Yes, that jewelry store has a lot of diamonds in it. Let's back the pickup truck into the plate glass window, grab as much as we can, and take off before the cops show up. Right? Then we get to persistent, and this is where you are both the target. You're not a target of opportunity anymore. You are a specifically targeted individual. You're being targeted. Right? And there's a, there's a, there's a notion of persistence. So in a lot of these, in these two previous cases, nobody, you're not really getting zero day expended on you, let's face it. Uh, nobody's willing to lose any of their secret attack sauce on you, right? When, you're, when you get enemies, and that's what they are, threats of this type, generally somebody is taking the time to write, to do an, uh, a recon on your network. They know what network 
uh, protecting network any malware appliance you have. They know what you run on your desktop. They know what they can and can't get away with sending you over email. They know generally which people in your network are the most gullible, hint all of them. Uh, and they'll send you something or push you something that they know has a very low probability of being detected, very high probability of effectiveness, low friction, high outcome. And it's generally intended to be used for you, which means that they've spent time on this. If they spend time on it, it's not something they're going to give up easily in terms of tradecraft, right? So they'd like to keep the tools they use fairly secret. So I've already said this, but the breakdown in terms of how much time you guys are spending from the IR perspective on this is roughly 80% on the generic threat, roughly 19% um, on the targeted, and about 1% on the persistent. Because by the time you get through the 80% and you're getting to the harder, we never get out of the easy loop. Getting to the harder loop, we do simply by sheer volume and workload, because nobody ever gets to the point where they're finding things that the signatures aren't telling us are there, because nobody has that kind of time. This is actually really, really backwards. So we're extremely backwards on this. And whether you've got the capabilities or not is almost irrelevant. You're spending your time closing tickets as an IR person. That's not generally the direction you want to go. So why the hell does this matter at all? Well, I think it does because there's vastly different types of response here. From an IR perspective, there's three different types of response, and this is where sort of the active defense stuff comes in. Um, and, and again, I'll just make it clear, we're not hacking anybody. Uh, we're trying to make sure we position, we're not building the French Maginot line again. Pardon me to anybody that's French, but they asked for it. Um, this is vastly different responses here, right? In a generic type of scenario where you've got stuff that just shows up, you just kill it, that's all. There's no intent, it doesn't matter. If it's on your system and it's wreaking havoc, nuke it. Now, we call it a tier one automated response, but that doesn't mean re-image the machine every time. Anybody that's tried to do that will understand and agree with the fact that that's a very short life expectancy in that job. By the third or fourth time you've re-imaged somebody's machine that day, you probably get a different kind of a phone call, right? So re-imaging machines doesn't work. I know it doesn't. I mean, it, it does, but to a degree. So how do you do that? Hey, we have these things called tools. Um, if you don't have anything on your endpoints, then this is a different conversation we should have, but we all have stuff on our endpoints. Hopefully it's well managed. Hey, back to asset management and, and good security hygiene. But they should be taking this burden out from us, right? Destroy it, re-image it, however you want to do it. Again, I kind of caution you against to re-image it. But destroy the thing that's causing the havoc, move on. Near zero human time expended is the, is the out, uh, expected outcome here. Uh, from a very well-known IR program, they would spend, uh, if they determined it was a level one, tier one threat, up to five minutes. That's a lot of time. Up to five minutes. So you have to be able to identify, here's a catch, you have to be identify what type of threat that is. If you can't, you don't know. All right, tier two, it's a kind of focused response. So you spend actually some time doing things like containment, uh, analysis, and destruction. So contain it, figure out, first off, get it off your network in however way you want. Uh, keep it from spreading itself, making other bad things. Um, analyze it, right, so you're not just chucking it. But the analysis actually helps you determine whether the thing is generic or, tar or persistent. So target is sort of like a transitional state for many IR folks. We would do minimal human time uh, expended here. 15 minutes probably, right? Once you've determined this is a tier two threat, up to 15 minutes of time on it. And then we get, then we actually have time for the persistent threats. And these are sort of the ones that get our, it should be getting our attention. Um, we should be getting giving these the attention because there's no signatures for these. Nothing automated uh, in terms of virus signatures is going to tell us that, hey, there's something here you don't know about because we don't know about it. So contain, analyze, remove, and recover. See, this, the cycle gets much longer. Um, containing it, analyzing it, removing it, uh, and recovery. Part of recovery is going to be things like evidence preservation. Because if you found something on your network that matches this category, odds are there's going to be an investigation. Chain of custody, things you have to start thinking about. How does that actually work? Um, 
one of the unfortunate uh, things that happens a lot is those of you that uh, that are just you know that have gotten into mentality and, and the cycle of just nuking machines, uh, you, end, you end up realizing that the FBI shows up asking for evidence and you tell them that you've destroyed it. It's kind of an awkward conversation. You spend the necessary human time that you have to on these types of events, um, and, and that is exactly what it means. However long it takes. Now it depends on whether you're dealing with an executive or an, or an end user. So use better judgment, but it's the, however long it takes to actually solve the problem. Because now we know that we're potentially playing chess against somebody that's also thinking the same way we are. They want in, we want them out. We'll kick them out, they'll come back. We'll kick them out again, they come back. They find different ways in. So this is, this is a, a chess match. The question is, how do you actually tell the difference? So I think this is where we start getting the utility out of things like threat intelligence. Because the atomic indicators that we have need context, and the goal really becomes intelligent prioritization. That's where active defense makes sense. You take the threats you get from the outside, combine it with internal data that you have, things you already know, model that in a near real-time way, and there's plenty of tools to do that, and then you can start doing intelligent prioritization. Does this Is this thing relevant? I get that everybody in the world says this is the OMG bad panda that's going to, you know, hack all the things in my network, does it even matter to me? Oh, by the way, they're targeting the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, I'm a bank. They probably don't want anything I have, right? Assuming you know all those things beforehand with some relative certainty. So what's opportunistic malware and what's an adversary? These are big, big differences. And we'll feed this intelligent process loop and it looks like this. So there's 11 steps in this. Um, and if you sit in the back, you probably can't see in these awful colors. So I'll read what's up there. Uh, and so on the left-hand side, you've got acquisition and secondary development. Uh, you've got triage, initial uh, collaboration and enrichment, distribution, execution, feedback, management, governance, and strategy. So that's how this thing works. Right? It's a, it's, a, it's a process loop. It's an OODA loop, if you will. So you start with some external indicators, run it through the loop. You end up with secondary indicators, things that don't come out from the outside. Yes, Dave. Thank you. Enriching it with external, uh, internal and external content. Notice I said internal and external content. These are very important things. Distribute and execute because you need to get intelligence into a place where it can actually be acted upon. Otherwise, it's just dumb data sitting someplace. And you ask the question of can you learn from the incident? Can you get better at doing what you do as a result of something? Can you improve from it? And then we can start actually chasing through that loop and start looking at things that are important and how do we respond to them in a, in a coordinated fashion. And I think that's how we figure out how to win, right? A couple of goals here. Raise the cost of the adversary. Know you're never going to be able to outspend a nation state or a wealthy, um, you know, somebody with a ton of oil money that's determined to crush your bank off the Internet. You won't be able to outspend them, but you can sure try Right? And you can do things that strategically raise their costs. And like criminal, all criminals and like any enterprise, because it's a criminal enterprise, there's still that word enterprise there. Right? Eventually the cost benefit scale goes in the wrong direction. They go, screw it. This isn't worth my time anymore. How often does that happen? I don't know. We don't have good data for this. Frustrating the adversary is also really cool. If you've ever seen anybody that's, that's got a really good hunt team or a really well oiled uh, security organization, Somebody will pop their network, get in, they'll find them, they'll notice the pattern, they'll patch that system, close that hole, they'll come in again, they'll kick them out, they'll come back in again, they'll kick them out. But every time they come back, they're forcing them to try something different, right? Okay, at first you're looking at MSO8 uh, patches, right? The stuff from 2008. All right, fine, then we close all those. Then we're, we force them to try phishing. We educate people on phishing and we do URL detection and stuff like that. Great, then we're sending attachments, we figure out that. Then they're like, all right, I gotta like, I got to go find a zero day to use against their systems. Now you're really upping the ante. And now they're burning tools and writing code to get into your stuff. That's really hardcore. So that means they're really trying. Right? And lastly, ultimately the goal is to keep them from achieving their objective. It's like that CNBC example I gave you guys earlier with the CEO. Data and in critical assets have a shelf life, generally speaking. They have an expiration time at which they don't become viable anymore. They're not important anymore. And if you can 
stave off the attack. Until then, you've won. So disrupting effort to achieve objectives and repeat is necessary. And I, I think of all the things that we do, this is how we define real security. I think that's what active defense really is all about. Because that is where we actually put our security tools and defenses and smart people to work to stop the bad guys, the real bad guys, not the things, you know, that accidentally hit us from getting the things that are important to us. There's a lot of stuff that we're not doing well in there. Anyway, so we have a, a this is out of the Enterprise Threat Intelligence Framework. Anybody that's interested in, um, uh, shoot me an email, solutions.research.optive.com. Uh, happy to answer them. Um, and that's it. Hope you learned something. Sorry about the color.